here's what Clang um, does. So I don't even have to show you the code. In fact, notice I, I took the code away. Yet you can see the error diagnostics are way better. Number one is the, diagno the first diagnostic is actually telling you what's wrong, right? Indirection requires a pointer. Well, that doesn't tell me that. It just says it's an invalid type to unary star. Right? That's number one improvement. Number two is it tells you what the type is. Well, that's nice. And number three, and certainly not least, is it highlights the exact point the error occurred and the range of the expression that it's complaining about, right? So it's very nice. And in an IDE, you would take this information and draw bubbles and cute graphics and stuff. But this is what we can do with a command line. The old dev kit did not do this well. Oh, no. no. <coughs> Once we got pre-compiled headers working in some of the other tools, you know, uh, we, we started, um, I don't know, not investing in the details, let's say. So now we're investing in the details. So you just saw the, um, the output. That that output, if you did that naively and stored source locations for every possible node in the AST, would make the ASTs really fast. Okay? Um, so we don't do that. So what we do is we, we derive it, because let's face it, when you have an error, it's not important that the compiler is fast at that point, and processors are fast. So we ask the expression, what is your range? And it does a, a, a search, and it bubbles up to the top, and it computes its range. And then we hand over the range to the um, error diagnostics code. And the error diagnostics code, even though it has the range, still doesn't know the extent. So what it does is it takes the source location, from it derives the logical location, the file ID, and it instantiates a lexer, okay, on the fly to just get the length of the token. Okay. <laughs> this is incredibly cool. This is incredibly cool. Chris wrote this routine, and when I saw it, I was, because I, I did the range stuff, I said, Chris, now plug it into your stuff, and he did it, and when I saw this routine, it, it was just, it's great stuff. Um, but it, it drives home that in this day and age, thinking deeply about the um, space-time trade-off is, is a really interesting problem, and I think something we can get right now, whereas traditionally compilers um, that were built Two decades ago, they said, man, I better learn everything I can about this program fragment at this point in time because I can't go back. It just wasn't part of the design space. So, Okay, so now let's talk about a bunch of numbers. How, how am I doing on time? What? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about some performance relative to compiling this thing called carbon.h. Most of you probably aren't Mac programmers. Um, um, other than the Apple people, obviously. But um, this um, is uh, the public API to a lot of our system services. And it's big, this file, right? 12.3 megabytes. Actually, the file is really small. Yeah. One file small. It's the source <laughs> files which feed in to, to it um, are large. And you can see there's quite a bit of stuff there. I don't have to go through it. You guys are capable of reading what's there. So let's look at time on a few uh, gigahertz Intel Core Duo. So right now, we spend that amount of time doing pre-processing and lexing. We spend that amount of time doing parsing. Right, almost nothing. And we spend that amount of time doing semantic analysis and tree building. Okay, so it roughly breaks down to 65, 10, 25. Okay, that's, um, that's how we're doing right now. So, to process 12 um, point what, three megabytes of goop, we're doing it in a quarter of a second on you know, a pretty mainstream processor. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, GCC, um, its preprocessor is about twice as slow as ours right now. And considering the effort that went into making it that fast, again, Chris is just amazing that he was able to compete with it so quickly. And um, it turns out that, as I said, it's unconventional that a compiler can actually measure that uh, middle number we're measuring. I can't do it in GCC. The closest you can get with GCC is dash F syntax only, and that isn't just parsing. It does a lot of other stuff. So that's how it breaks down. 
And at least for doing the same batch type of compilation that GCC does, we're two and a half times faster at the moment. Okay. So two and a half times is good. That's me, I'm sorry. Um, we really want 10x. So the way to get 10x is to um, have whole program ASTs. So we want to, um, our goal is to make these space efficient, easy to access, serialize them for disk, and basically um, have uh, the equivalent of precompiled headers for your whole program. Except they're not headers, it's just precompiled code. Um, and the benefit here is it'll make everything faster, okay? Um, in fact, um, one of the folks here did refactoring with our old dev kit in Xcode. In fact, we're releasing it really soon. And um, uh, one of the issues is since we don't support precompiled headers, you know, circa 1990 anymore because it was a feature that was replaced by Mr. Keating's work, um, uh, we unfortunately have refactoring that isn't as fast as it could be, right? So uh, we hope to bring back um, this type of speed benefit in this new front end and have all these uh, types of applications benefit from that. So let's look at the space. So as I said, the input source here is that. Now, the pre-processed source is only 3.5 megabytes. So that explains why we're spending 65% in the pre-processor, right? It's having to eat that much more uh, code. Um, now, here's the ASTs we have. Now, it turns out that the most um, costly bit of um, data are the identifiers and strings. Okay, so they're 2.1 megabytes. Now I include them because even though they're not in AST, they are data that the AST needs to be useful, right? Um, so, but still very exciting that it's only 30% larger than the source code, right? Which is pretty cool because it's in a highly structured, very useful form, and 30% is not a big price to pay, especially when you look at the GCC trees, which are that, right? <laughs> Now, it's a little bit unfair, right? Because the abstract syntax trees don't contain a lot of the data that GCC does. GCC's trees contain data for um, generating code, right? RASTs don't do any of that. But it turns out this is a header file. So guess what? Most of GCC's data structures are filled with zeros, right? Again, because it's not factored correctly, right? So um, whatever. Um, uh, we're excited about this, and, and it, I should note down here these numbers. These are the number of instances of the AST. So uh, we have about 50,000 decal ASTs, 31,000 statements and expressions, and 26,000 types for, for this. So now let's just review what the ASTs look like. The most um, interesting class hierarchy we have is for declarations. So um, there's the root decal, which is abstract. We have a value decal, field decal, and type decal. And um, right below that, we have functions, variables, and a new constants. We have, um, right below variables, we have all the scope information that's encapsulated in the class um, type. So when you get an object um, of one of these classes, you could ask it, are you a block variable, or your file variable, that kind of stuff. Um, here we have tag decals, type def decals, and records in a new. So this is it for declarations. If, if the hierarchies work well for us, it's fairly straightforward. And if you superimpose how many instances uh, each of these guys. And the reason it's interesting to look at the number of instances is part of the reason this is factored this way is for performance. Now it just turns out that the way we modeled it and performance actually go hand in glove. Right? There's nothing unnatural about this hierarchy for performance reasons. Right? So it is interesting when the two um, come together, when you say, wow, that, that makes sense, and yeah, that's 